Hello and welcome to The Winning Post and those of you who were with us last week, remember we are in conversation with Robert Sangster's son, Adam Sangster. For those of you who are joining us just this week, well, we did go over Robert Sangster's life. We are going to continue talking about Robert Sangster. He was one of the greatest, greatest men in horse racing history anywhere in the world. And today I'm fortunate enough to be sitting in Australia at Swetnam with his son. Adam, let's continue where we had left off. When we had last when we had last left off and we had broken off in the last episode, we talked about the tough time, which was unfortunately the time when your parents did get divorced. But moving on from there, your 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 mom never wanted you to go into horse racing. How did you eventually land up here? Yes. Uh, no, she didn't want us to go or myself to go into certainly into uh, into horses, but uh, uh, I was lucky enough to get a to get a job in finance in, in London and uh, after four years of working there they then invited me up to Hong Kong so I did a stint for the same company in Hong Kong and my Australia, Australian operation at the time uh, and still is, is run by our chairman is David Coles and he's 85 years old and he comes in to the office every day but he used to send up to my father every day, every press cutting from every interstate uh, newspaper which involved one of his horses. I mean, he had at one point, he had, I think, 120 horses in training here with uh, 15 different trainers. Uh, but uh, this gentleman used to, would every day, cut out every article, every race form, guide, send it up by fax. I mean, thank God we had fax then. Um, and uh, father used to every morning, if it was in America or if it was uh, in England or the Isle of Man or wherever he was, he was um, he, he, he went to bed the night before, these faxes would arrive and basically they would tell him more about his horses in, in the southern hemisphere, especially Australasia, than uh, they did in Europe. So dad had, a, uh, he had amazing sort of affiliation with Australia, especially having married a, uh, an Australian, a good, good, good lady. and. Um, he, that really, with my working up in, in Hong Kong, uh, I used to come down to Australia for hit and runs for, for the big races, represent uh, my father who couldn't make it at the time, or if he was, if he was in Australia, even more fun, and uh, really uh, got to know the Australians pretty well, and in Hong Kong, a lot of them came up there to, to, um, to if it wasn't to sell horses, it was to race horses, so there was a great affiliation I had with Australia. So when our company got, uh, our company I was working for got taken over by the Hong Kong Bank, I looked at my offsider and I said, well, I think I'll step sideways and get involved in, in, in racing. And it was at the time when my father actually was getting divorced from his second wife um, and had been married for the third time. And she was an English lady and she didn't really like coming down to Australia as much as uh, as much as my father did. So he was looking at closing, probably looking at closing down our Australian operation. And I said, well, I'll go down there and uh, I'll pick up the reins and, and run with it. And, uh, and uh, we, we did that and uh, I did that and uh, moved to Adelaide and worked in Adelaide for a couple of years in our office there and then, uh, and then moved to Melbourne where we bought this, this stud, Swetnam stud in um, in Victoria. Uh, we'd had an operation in New South Wales uh, since 1988 but um, uh, we then we had a big affiliation in in, uh, in New Zealand with Patrick Hogan where I worked when I first left school for, for a season with Sir Tristram and uh, we really sort of uh, we, were, we, we were getting very much involved with a lot of the fillies which were raced on the track and we decided to put them into the, the, uh, the breeding barn. Uh, we had the stallions, we'd won the golden slipper uh, with marauding. We had a lot of stallion shares and, um, and we became, uh, he, he became uh, uh, I mean, a significant influence on, in Australia. And uh, really I came down to look after that. And we had a lot of fun together. I mean, uh, I'd say Dan's best friends were probably in Australia. I mean, He'd come out here for the Melbourne Cup in, in late October, early November. Uh, it's, it stayed for, for, for a long time. He'd then come over in for the Easter sales uh, uh, in Sydney. 
Okay, you could stay for a month, two months, and you'd have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the man, and you'd you know, a lot of lunches, which went into a lot of dinners. Um, and he had a, he had he had terrific com 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 camaraderie down here with his Australian friends, and uh, he had a very close relationship with the Hayes family, which was continuing. But he and Colin Hayes were were were, were two different characters, but two soulmates, and they won a lot of races and had a lot of fun. And eventually you, you took over the farm from the Hayes family. Yeah, that's right. I took over um, this operation. When David, David Hayes was training in Hong Kong when we bought this property in 1994. And uh, we, we, we stand seven stallions here. And when he came back from Hong Kong, though, he wanted to really just concentrate on training and not breeding. And that's when I stepped in and purchased his share and subsequently purchased a family share. Now tell me, talk about the family, um, your siblings, what are they doing right now? Yeah, well, uh, Guy, my eldest, my eldest uh, brother, he looks after the finance in Europe and uh, based at Manton, which is our training farm in, uh, in Marlborough, it's 2,500 acres, uh, where we have Brian Meehan who trains there, great Northern Irish um, uh, um, conditioner. And my brother Ben is really the horseman. I mean, Ben got taught by the Irish. Demi O'Byrne really uh, taught Ben a lot, a lot um, how, to, how, to, how to look at the horses. And, uh, and Ben is a very good judge and a very smart man. And he looks after all the, the Northern Hemisphere bloodstock. Um, and really myself down here, I, I look after my own bloodstock down here with a lot of advisors. I mean, I certainly know what my strengths are and I, I can fairly admit what my weaknesses are and to cover those weaknesses I have advisors who are horse people who tell me exactly the, the right horses. Right, okay we're going to take a very short break on the winning post we're in conversation with Adam Sangster, Robert Sangster's son and when we come back we'll carry on exactly where we left off don't go anywhere if you do come right back very quickly. Welcome back to The Winning Post and we were in conversation with Adam Sanks and are going to continue to do so. Now, uh, when we left off, we were talking about your siblings and what they're doing right now. Um, let's just come back to your dad for a moment and we come back to Swetnam and your operation here in just a moment. But let's talk about the one that actually got away and that was El Gran Senor in 1984. Now, I remember watching that race and I have my own opinion on that, but take us through what you remember from that race. Well, it was... I know a lot of pain happened, and uh, when I say pain, it was um, we father had had managed to put together a deal to sell the stallion if he won the Derby to an American outfit for forty million dollars, and I believe El Gran Senor was the shortest price favourite going into the Derby. I think he was six to four on, and uh, he'd won the two thousand guineas. He was um, strong, he was ready for it, and he subsequently got beaten by Secreto, who was ridden by Christy Roach, owned by an Argentinian, and trained by David O'Brien, who was Vincent's son, and Vincent trained El Gran Senor. So um, it, was, it, was, it was a sad time. It wouldn't surprise me, I mean, it uh, wouldn't surprise me if that really did sort of, sort of, uh, um, st uh, that was a catalyst of things to re when the wheels started to fall off a little bit between the Coolmore and my father, and just just when when we probably probably did get out of not get out of when we sold down in in Coolmore uh, because it was a very very sad time because David O'Brien trained trained Secreto, and I don't think I, th I think because the deal was so so big. Um, that I think his, his, his father was upset that, you know, very proud that his son had won the race, but also I think they're upset that, um, that uh, this deal had actually not, not been pulled off. And, uh, and I know my father was incredibly upset about it, uh, just really on a family basis. The money didn't matter at all. It was more on the family. Um, he was very proud of David, and David won, had won with a cert for us with, um, in the Irish derby and the French derby. And, and many other winners, but uh, this one did. I think it did hurt, 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 um, 
hurt, hurt that relationship, uh, which was a shame. Uh, but uh, you know, over time things have got a lot better, but uh, uh, and, uh, and we're absolutely fine. But I think that did, did just just really was a little bit, um, you know, it was a, a bit of a crucial time, should I say? Okay, and. Uh... Well, of course, there were good times after that, including Royal Academy, who went on to win mm. in um, in Belmont in in New York, and that was a wonderful time because Lester had just come come back from prison, and you know he was back. He wasn't supposed to ride the horse, but he managed to, you know, as Lester always does, get onto the right horses at the right time. I was there, and I remember that race, as were some of my friends who are obviously viewing this at home. But we, we, we were watching this. It was an incredible moment, wasn't it? Oh, it really was. And it, that was at a time when um, he was actually owned by Classic Thoroughbreds, which was a group. Um, it was the first time which um, uh, Stalin nominations and horses had been bought through the stock market. And I was working in the stock market at the time. And, uh, and Royal Academy was part of this. And I remember rather than backing him, I bought um, some shares in the company. So actually the shares did go up quite substantially after that. But then on the other hand of it, I backed, uh, I think we, we had another horse, which was a uh, uh, favorite for the Guineas called, uh, I think it was Sotter Grandi or, or no, Saratogan. And that was when the share price was 40p. And Saratogan got beaten, and I think after the race, about 10 minutes after the race, I think the shares were worth, worth about 3p. <laughs> but uh, really, uh, Royal Academy, he was a lovely looking horse. And uh, he's, still, he's still serving when he served last season here in Australia. Uh, he's produced over 120 stakes winners. Uh, very honest horse, very underrated as a stallion. Great broodmare sire. And that day, Mo, you were there. I only watched it, but when Lester came down the outside, I mean, especially for what Lester had been through and what, I mean, that was, I know Vincent, that was a very touching moment for Vincent. Down to the final furlong, it's all Greek to me, has a short lead, expensive decision, falling back, mark of distinction, Royal Academy is thundering down the center of the turf course, and Steinle is fifth, they're coming down to the finish, Lester Piggott flailing away at Royal Academy, it's all Greek to me, toward the inside, here's the wire, head bombing finish, I don't think I'll ever forget that ever in my life. But um, you know, you mentioned Royal Academy, and he is a son of Nijinsky. Nijinsky, of course, is was a son of Northern Dancer. Now your dad believed in Northern Dancer, and even before the rest of the world did. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he had a very close relationship with the Taylor family, um, and uh, he he did. But uh, it was really Vincent who who did find that particular line and the, the horses which were molded uh, into what he considered or the horses which would see, suit the European conditions. And uh, that was really, was, it was, a, was a footpath which, um, which uh, a lot of people have trodden over, over the years and sons of and will continue. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's something which certainly I'm very proud of my father and I'm very, I know that the whole, the whole O'Brien family are very proud of it as well. And it changed, it changed the face of racing history forever. Northern Dancer did that. Okay, we're going to take a very short break and come back and talk now about your stallion, Swetnam, and find out what's going on in your life right now. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Winning Post and moving straight on, Adam, now let's talk about your operation here. Now, you've got a number of stallions here and, and you're happy and you're doing very well too. Yeah, we're very lucky here, Mo. I mean, this property itself, it's 900 acres, sits on three and a half kilometers of river frontage and I've got a winery next door, which my father was always very proud of um, because actually a lot of our operations, stud operations were next door to wineries because it's a uh, uh, seen a good soil and horses um, really they, they sort of they go hand in hand but uh, yeah you're right we've got um, seven stallions here of which uh, in the past we've had stallions such as Rory's Jester, Scenic, Dane Hill Dancer, Jern, Favourite Trick, um, Celtic Swing and at the moment we've got uh, as I say seven our main, main one at the moment is someone called Dash for Cash, 
Uh, he's a very prolific sire of, um, of sprinters. Uh, I very much concentrate here and my advisors, uh, uh, we look at sprinting horses. We find ones with good bone, good behind the saddle, and really do produce foals which can grow into good yearlings, which can be popular in the yearling, uh, in the yearling uh, sales. I mean, it's, it's very important to have good bone and, um, and uh, good muscle and athletic types of, uh, of, of progeny. And the stallions which we have, which you're going to see tomorrow, you'll, you'll certainly see there's a very common thread that they are sprinting type of horses. Um, our stallions do suit their, their pedigrees. I mean, we've, we've, we, we turn back a lot of stallions because we do go through an enormous process to make sure that they suit the conditions for racing conditions down here. Bart Cummings always said that Australian race courses were made for the people while European race courses were made for the horses. So really you have to sort of, um, you've got to make sure that, uh, that the right horse, the well, right horse sorts, suits, suits the right conditions. So um, the stallions here, which we do have, and we are continuing to grow our stallion band, have got the right pedigree, which suit the Australian conditions and are proven to, uh, to cater for every, all, all clientele. All right, and of course, uh, on the Winning Post and on Horse Sense for viewers in the Singapore market, we, w we are going to do a very special feature on Swetnam and its stallions. But we're going to continue chatting with Adam. And Adam, I'm going to ask you, um, let's, let's talk about some of the best moments that you had um, with your dad, for example, outside of racing, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Without getting you into no, kind of front no, it's of good. Course. It's good. It's good. I mean, we uh, uh, we had a lot of fun when he was when he when he was a, when he was uh, on the golf course. I mean, he loved his golf. Uh, he was a man who who always after a good lunch, uh, especially in the Caribbean. I mean, he was he he was a domiciled of Barbados, uh, and he had the Sandy Lane Golf Course. And we lived on the Sandy Lane Estate. Um, in Barbados, and we always used to play at three, three o'clock every every afternoon, and play nine holes, have a few jars afterwards, and great camaraderie. And he always used to say that he, if he ever had a house, or well, whenever he chose a house, it would, with which particular wife it was uh, at the time, it always has to have had a criteria of being close to an airport, or 15 minutes from an airport, 15 minutes from the best restaurant, and 15 minutes from a uh, a golf course. Oh, that's, that's something <laughs> worth remembering. Yes. Now, now you know you you've you've gone out and um, in your home you've actually picked you bought stuff you know which which historically uh, have a lot of significance in the world of horse racing. For example, um, you bought the actual silks that Farlap's jockeys wore. Mm, yeah, the silks sitting just there behind me. Uh, yeah, and uh, Farlap's uh, the jockey Jim Pike rode in. 1929, still got the original mud on them. Uh, took them to the uh, uh, the Melbourne uh, Melbourne Art Centre to just get them restored, and she said, "Absolutely, just keep them in pristine condition." Because to me, I mean, it's a bit of racing Absolutely. history, and it's for cricketers. It's like Sir Donald Bradman's hat or Ned Kelly's armour, and it sits a proud place here uh, at Swettenham. And uh, no, I was very proud to to manage to to secure him about 10 years ago. All right, now let's, let's, uh, let's talk about one very, one very quick point I want to touch upon, which is uh, about you. You worked with Sir Tristram, and Sir Tristram has turned out to be one of the great influences on horse racing, at least in the Southern Hemisphere. Yes. He stood at Cambridge Stud. He lies at Cambridge Stud now, and because uh, uh, he passed away a number of years ago, but. My father had a very good relationship with Sir Patrick Hogan and, uh, and backed Sir Patrick in the early days and we bought a significant stake in Sir Tristram. Uh, sent all our mares to Cambridge Stud and um, I worked with him in 1984 and the first mare which I was allowed because I was fresh out of school and after being there three, three or four months managed to fold down a couple of mares and the first night I managed to with, with obviously with the help of a couple of assistants, um, popped out, well, fall down Marauding, who won the Golden Slipper, and uh, the other horse was called Capstad, and Capstad was related to the great race mare Habitti, and he 
himself. I leased him off my father and he won two group ones and, and was, was heralded as the best, the best horse, the most expensive horse ever bought out of training in 1987 um, in April and I was lucky to be part of that. Last of all in a well bunched field, they're into the straight down to the 400, twining the leader, half a length to Carpstad and then mighty dear Bronx Bomber, swift invite the outside, Rancho Ruler can't get clear at the 300 now and Carpstad raced up to twining, mighty dear issuing a challenge, they're followed by Bronx Bomber and Rancho Ruler behind them, Carpstad hands and heels by more than a length to mighty dear, Rancho Ruler finishing quickly, Carpstad in front, holding a length break from Rancho Ruler and mighty dear and Carpstad wins the size, Carpstead first by a length to Rancho Ruler, third either Bronx Bomber or Mighty Deer and then Ma Okay and if if you could say one thing to your dad today what would it be? Uh, come back. <laughs> come back, alright. Well, well what I'm going to ask you to do, that's the um, end of this episode, it's been fantastic, I'm going to request you to sign this copy of Horse Trader for us on behalf of you and your father please. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful book and for those of you who haven't read it, it isn't easily available but I promise you once I started reading it I couldn't put it down. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Winning Post. Adam, you've been a wonderful guest and a very, very gracious host. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael.